My name is Christian Lindke, and I am the program director of the Arslan program, and I've had the great pleasure of working with the LA County Office of Education, the Constitutional Rights Foundation, and the Reagan Foundation, and the Center for Civic Education for the past years in the designing of this program that concentrates on something that is quintessentially important in the civics education of our students in the United States and in understanding democracy. And I often think back to the words that are in the preamble of the Constitution. When I think of the Constitution, the first words that I think of are in order to form a more perfect union. These words, which were drafted by Governor Morris, my favorite founding father, because he, well, for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is that it is the most easily turned into a cool nickname. I tend to call him the Goov. Um, but when he drafted these words, he set in motion what I consider to be the American experiment, which is an experiment in deliberation. We are a country that, as we'll see when the next uh, next week occurs that as the 17th approaches, a number of news agencies will probably tell us how little our American citizens know about the Constitution and about the way that our government works. They will say 38% of Americans, or some number like that, understand how our government works. And this is usually done through some form of survey where they call people at random and they just ask them as if they're on the hot seat these questions about government. And they do do relatively poorly on these questions, and it's our goal and our, our need to make sure that people are more informed on that. But what they don't tell you is that when they're measured two other ways, they do better. When they're asked questions and given a day to come back with the answers, well, they, they come back with the right answers. But also, if they're asked the questions and offered money to come up with the correct answer, they tend to perform better as well, uh, even without time to look things up. So, things are not as desperate as sometimes we assume that them to be, but they are as important and vital as, as we think that they are. And why I focused on those words, more perfect union, is because the American founders set in place what I consider to be a dialogue, a dialogue of what is the best government, a dialogue of how to promote a more perfect government, never a perfect government, but always seeking to approach that, that unattainable goal. And the document that they created was very short. Right? We've handed out pocket constitutions today, but only this much is the actual constitution itself. What is happened in America since then is thousands upon thousands upon thousands, maybe millions of pages of deliberation as to what these words mean and how these words should be applied to our society. And that started early. If you compare this to the Federalist Papers, which were written immediately thereafter, you see already the dialogue of what our nation was to become occurring. And this is something that happens on a daily basis. And it's something that we as educators and nonprofit program directors are a part of and need to instill in our young people and in future generations this desire to deliberate as to what it means to be a more perfect union. And that's why I am so happy uh, that we're here in our 10th year. I am honored to be a participant, and I am honored to uh, introduce our second, uh, inter inter what, <laughs> second speaker today, uh, Tony Penny from the Reagan Foundation. If you could come on up. And my first order of business is to invite four very wonderful young helpers to help us start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if I could invite the young ladies Linkey and the young ladies Penny to the stage to help lead us in the pledge and ask that you all please rise. Okay, girls. Go ahead and face the flag. Face the flag. Hands on your hearts. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
First rule of showbiz is never follow children or animals. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, it's our 10th annual California Constitution Day. My name is Tony Penny and I'm the director of the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center. Uh, on behalf of Mrs. Reagan, our board of trustees, and the entire staff that we have here, I want to welcome you to President Reagan's library. Uh, I also wanted to say a quick thank you to all the organizations we work with to put to get to the, today's event together. Uh, so thank you to Christian and Arsalan and Maria and the Center for Civic Education, Damon and the Constitutional Rights Foundation, and of course, uh, Michelle and Laiko. We, uh, we, we love working with you every year. This is one of my favorite days of the year. Um, I also just a, a couple of very quick logistical notes. Um, the events today are taking place in two different buildings. So we have three of the venues are here. The Roosevelt and Jefferson rooms are back there. This is the Presidential Learning Center. And then we also have the Air Force One boardroom and the Discovery Center classroom. And the Discovery Center are over in the other building. Um, and when you find a giant plane that seven presidents have flown on, you'll know you're there. Uh, so that's over there. Uh, and if you want to take part in one of the Discovery Center simulations, I believe we might have some spots still open. Uh, you can see Tracy there, but if you want to do that in the afternoon, you have to make sure you sign up ahead of time because there are a limited number of spaces. Uh, when I think about the focus of our gathering today, I know this is just the sort of event that President Reagan would have wanted to have at his library. Uh, in 1987, President Reagan was in office for the bicentennial celebration of the Constitution. Uh, and one of the things he said was, despite the long odds against success, the framers were able, through numerous compromises, to fashion a blueprint for a new nation. Today, 200 years later, that Constitution is the oldest written instrument of democratic rule in the world still in use, and continues to proclaim and to shape a peaceful revolution toward freedom and prosperity for all mankind. Now, here we are, 27 years after that, still celebrating the magnificence of the Constitution. Uh, I was listening to one of my favorite constitutional scholars, uh, Dr. Gordon Lloyd of Pepperdine the other day, and he noted that this was the first time in history uh, that a nation had been born by choice. There had been a lot of nations that were born through force or through accident. Um, but it really was pretty special that 55 people, I mean, imagine, you know, sometimes you get two people in a room, you can't agree on anything. Um, and bringing 55 people from 13 different uh, states together to try and form a new nation, it really was miraculous what happened, uh, especially given how hot it was uh, in Philadelphia that summer. Uh, I don't think they wore cool clothing back then. Um, and though this is certainly a day for reverence, it's also a day for celebration. And celebrations are fun, so I thought I'd wrap up my remarks with my favorite top five fun facts about the Constitution. Half of David Letterman, right? <laughs> top five. Number five, actually, uh, Christian already mentioned the Gouv. Governor Morris, there's a great book called The Rake Who Wrote the Constitution. Governor Morris was described as a witty, peg-legged ladies' man. He was a native of New York who represented Pennsylvania during the Constitutional Convention. He's credited with being the author of the preamble, as you pointed out, uh, the man who gave New York City its street grid and New York State the Erie Canal. Uh, and another interesting story about him, the story behind his peg leg is that he was wounded in a carriage accident. That's kind of the official party line. But there's much evidence to suggest that that carriage accident involved him being in the carriage with another man's wife. And in an attempt to not be caught, he leapt from the carriage, shattered his leg, and had it replaced with a peg on which he'd like to dance. Number four. Today there's a tremendous amount of emphasis on the need for transparency in government. Uh, here in California we have the Brown Act that, that governs uh, public meetings and that sort of thing, and we have never before seen reams of data and information about uh, people who work um, for the public. Uh, the framers, though, were not as fond of this sort of transparency. In fact, despite this painting by Christie, which shows the windows and the curtain wide open, kind of the light of freedom and democracy coming in, uh, the Constitution itself was very secretive. They closed the windows, they drew the curtains, uh, because they were doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. But it turned out okay, so in the end, uh, it, it was good. Number three. This is about age. I'm always fascinated by this sort of thing. Uh, the average age of the delegates to the Constitution was 43. Uh, there were four delegates who were actually 43, including Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts. And if you're not familiar with him, you are probably familiar with uh, a term that has come from his name, gerrymandering. Um, the term gerrymandering comes from him and it describes the salamander-like shape 
of a, a district they redrew to make sure that his Democratic Republicans could dominate the uh, Massachusetts State Senate. The youngest delegate was 26, Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey, and the oldest, does anybody know the oldest? This seems like a smart crowd, Ben Franklin. Whoops, what happened there? There we go. At 81, he was 81. Uh, number two, this is just kind of interesting. So uh, James Madison, considered the father of the Constitution, uh, stayed at Mary's boarding house, Mary House's boarding house. There were five delegates who stayed there. And in fact, this is where they hatched the uh, Virginia plan. The Virginia delegates did this. This is a shot of that very same spot in the 1980s. It was a public restroom. <laughs> with a little plaque on the side that James Madison once uh, worked here. Uh, but later they tore that down and now there's a plaque there about the First Amendment and also a lovely entrance into the public transportation system. So the preservation of history is alive and well. And finally, the, uh, my, my favorite fun fact, uh, this is, uh, if you can see it, this is the tavern bill from the celebration goodbye party for General Washington at the City Tavern at the conclusion of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, you can see there's one food item on there, relishes and olives. And then there's a quite a bit of non-food items on there as well uh, for a total uh, 89 pounds. So there were 55 delegates. Mostly there was a lot of alcohol consumed. In modern day cost, it's about $15,000, the goodbye party. So the founding fathers knew how to celebrate something good. Uh, another interesting fact, there were German musicians who played at that farewell party. Uh, and these German musicians had, less than a decade earlier, been mercenary soldiers who had been fighting against General Washington uh, in the Revolutionary War. So 227 years later, we continue to celebrate, continue to preserve the noble vision of our framers. Um, and you probably have heard the story about Ben Franklin as they were walking out. Somebody said, well, what kind of government do we have? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. Uh, keeping it requires a lot of hard work. Uh, Ronald Reagan reminds us, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It has to be preserved and passed on from one generation to the next. Uh, so for all the teachers, administrators, and attendants today, we thank you for attending. We thank you for investing a Saturday uh, to be here for this um, and for all you do to keep the republic. Uh, and for all the students who are with us today, there's a number of students I'm looking at you. Raise your hand if you're a student today. Excellent. Students are the best. All right, let's give a hand to the students. Uh, we thank you for attending and for the hard work you are doing as students to be engaged and informed citizens. It won't be long until we turn this work over to you, so get ready. Uh, we're going to need you. Speaking of hard work, it is my honor to introduce our morning keynote session uh, from two of the hardest working advocates for civic learning here in California and nationally. Uh, and here to speak about the need for revitalizing civic learning in California, it's my honor to introduce Debbie Genzer, who was lead staff to the Chief Justice for the California Civic Learning Task Force, uh, and the lady who we often call here the Queen of Social Studies, from the Los Angeles County Office of Education, the California Civic Learning Task Force, and the President of the National Council for the Social Studies, and I think that's just three of about 7,000 different affiliations she has, but Dr. Michelle Herzog, so thank you very much, and uh, please welcome them to the stage. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you to all of you who are here today. Let me again jump in and, and rethank and thank again the wonderful committee that comes together. Ten years we've been doing this. Ten years. Isn't that fantastic? So when budgets are cut and our work is marginalized to be able to stay alive, we do it because we have great partners. So Tony Penny and Janet Tran here at the uh, Walter and Nina Annenberg Presidential Learning Center have just been fabulous in hosting us today. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Christian Lenke from the Arsenal Foundation, who has just been able to fund this and enable you to get stipends if you stay the entire day. And just rem as, a, as a quick reminder, if you are registered for the day, make sure you sign out at the end of the day, too. That's important. Damon Haas and Constitutional Rights Foundation. Damon's here running around. He's handled all that registration for us. Maria Gall is here from the Center for Civic Ed. Those pocket constitutions are not free. She's donated all of them for you to take back and all the wonderful materials here. And of course, 
I urge all of you, you've, you've demonstrated great commitment by being here today, and you can continue that by joining, joining the local organizations. Come by over here to Martha Infante, who's income, um, president of the Southern California Social Science Association, Jackie Purdy, who is behind the scenes on everything. Make sure you join California Council for the Social Studies and come to the big Autry event, big kickoff on October 11th. So make sure you come to that too. And while you're at it, join National Council for the Social Studies too. So I'm very excited uh, to be here and very excited to be president this year of our national organization. So. Um, let me put, uh, change my hat here. I'm wearing multiple hats today. So let me change out my PowerPoint and we'll get started. So here's, here's some of the top five reasons you need to join NCSS. I love that. That was very cute. You know, we are the national organization representing all social studies educators from across the nation. And this year, in my role as president, I'm very excited about promoting what our four primary functions are that support you at the ground level. One is to share great resources and information around social studies uh, throughout. We have wonderful publications. We have a conference coming up in Boston. So I'm hoping you all picked up one of the previews for the conference and think about coming to that. Second, we're a major arm for advocacy for social studies at the national level. We work the Hill. I'll be in Washington next week meeting with Senator Boxer and Feinstein's office, my own congressperson's office. We're continually talking to legislators in making sure they understand that one of the core but most important subjects is the social studies. And when we get forward and move forward with ESEA reauthorization, we don't want to be left behind this time, do we? So NCSS is working hard at the national level to promote that with an advocacy piece. We're all about membership and increasing our numbers because the more numbers we have behind them, the bigger voice we can have in Washington, D.C. Plus, it's a major revenue source for us as well. So that's another reason we encourage folks to join. And last but not least is promoting social studies excellence. And we are doing that in a big way with our new document, the College career and civic life C3 framework for social studies state standards. So I want to take a few minutes to kind of talk a little bit about this. I'm doing a session after if you want to hear more. But this really is putting NCSS at the center of all things social studies by putting forth this document. As you know, Common Core has its ELA, English Language Arts. It's got its mathematics. And you're all starting to hear about next generation science standards. So where's our document? Where's the piece for social studies? And I got to tell you, this is it. California has not formally adopted this framework, but you need to know this is a powerful piece that you can use in your classrooms to increase the rigor and promote civic learning. Let me go through a couple slides um, before I turn over. So this kind of started, this effort started a good four or five years ago because we realized that social studies is being marginalized. We need students that need to be motivated to learn about social studies. And of course, the future of our democracy is at stake. So if we're not in the pool, if we're not part of this, we're going to get left behind. And that was some of the reasons and rationale for moving this forward. Before we did, though, we had to bring together all the organizations at the national level to agree to this work. So the history community, the economics community, the geography community, and the civics community came together. And they brought all of their work together. And the first thing we had to do was figure out what are we going to call ourselves. Because in some places, we're history social science, right? That's what we're called to in here. In some states, it's social studies. In some states, it's history social studies. You got 15 different words for the same thing. Let's get together and figure that out. So the national organizations of all those entities came together. All of these groups 
So you got, you got to know these are the people at the top levels sitting in the same room. That in and of itself was a watershed moment. Let's not even go there. Because everybody's fighting over that little sliver of pie that we're allowed to get. And out of that conversation came an agreement to call our discipline social studies and to define it in this way. So now we are putting this forward as the official name of our discipline and definition for uh, the work that we do. And you see what the purpose is, to develop responsible, informed, and engaged citizens and to foster civic, global, historical, geographic, and economic literacy. So once we got that done, no easy lift, we could get to work. And this was a three-year effort and no, it was not done by President Obama. It was not a federal initiative. It was a state-led effort, just like the Common Core. It included 23 states, affiliate members from LA County Office of Ed, University of Delaware, organizations, all these folks working through um, the Social Studies Assessment Curriculum and Instructional Group. These organizations in the same room committed to the same task. Because if all those folks aren't on board, you might as well pack up and go home. So I know you're familiar with these groups. You need to know this is the seal of approval. This is almost the story where you need to see the credits first before you know, the thing, know what the content is. So we created this document, looks like this. Um, and who's the audience? It's for st primarily, it started out as an effort for states using this as a guideline to update their state social studies standards. Now we know states are all over the place with this. Some have recently updated, some um, are in the process right now, and some haven't done it since 1998, not to name any names. But, so even with states who are not in the process of updating, it also, we also realize this is a powerful document for people at the local level as well, to take what you have and increase and strengthen your program to enhance the rigor of social studies, which is what Common Core calls for, to build those critical thinking and problem solving skills, which is what we do anyway really well in social studies, and also as a bridge to the Common Core. How many of you are in classrooms being asked, so what are you doing to implement Common Core? Yeah, you get that question every day. And then you look at the standards we currently have and you're like, I don't know how to do this. Then we've got two different things. I want you to think of this as the bridge to Common Core, because there are direct alignments to that as well. What's the goal? For students to study all four of these disciplines, not just history, because our standards are heavy in history, but kind of light in the others, but all four, civics, econ, ge geography, and history, to become active and engaged citizens. So we are leading that effort at National Council for the Social Studies. I want you to keep this website close and personal, socialstudies.org slash c3. Because when you go there, you can download this for free. We are creating webcasts, introductory webcasts for you to use and share with your staffs. We are creating, in your packet, you have a one-pager, right, in your program. Did you see that? I can't put my hands on mine now, but. You'll see that, you can pull that down. Um, and you can also see this wonderful, short, five minute video snapshot of what social studies looks like in a fifth grade classroom using the C3. And our star of today's performance is the most lovely Rebecca Welbuena. Where is Rebecca? Come out from under the table. Okay, there she is. She's available for autographs. So let me show you this, this little quick video. Civic Life C3 Framework for Social Studies State Standards was a collaborative effort over three years. It included social studies teachers from across the nation, 
heads of social studies at state departments of education, institutes of higher education, and a number of social studies professional organizations who all lent their expertise and excitement for increasing the rigor and relevance of social studies for students across America. We all know how it's important to prepare kids for college and career. We also believe that social studies is the subject best suited to prepare them to be effective citizens in the 21st century. The lesson you're about to see, led by Rebecca Valbuena at Glendora School District, will show you what it looks like in the classroom for fifth grade students as they develop their understanding of constitutional principles and apply it in the real world to prepare them to be engaged citizens in the 21st century. We're going to be doing some reading today, so I would like you to take out the Constitution book from your book basket. The series of lessons is designed to help students investigate um, the importance of civic involvement and that they understand their role as citizens now and into adulthood. And throughout the lessons, they learn how and why people participate in the democratic process. They study the fundamental principles of the Constitution and how the Constitution changed over time. One of the biggest goals of the series is that students can describe a government that is by the people, a government in which citizens exercise their power by voting. We do have rights, and our rights are won, and it's voting that protects those rights. So having the power to vote is part of living in a democracy. The ultimate goal is that students are involved now and that they continue to be involved into adulthood. In a perfect world, I'd want them to register to vote the second they turn 18 and exercise that right to vote into adulthood. Dimension 1 begins with a question, an inquiry. We want students to get excited about learning social studies, and so we start with what we call a compelling question. Today's compelling question will ask students, why is it important to vote, and does it really matter? The idea is to get them excited about learning their subject. Voting matters because your voice can be heard, and you can make decisions based on how you feel and your opinions. Dimension two is about applying disciplinary tools and concepts. Not just looking through the lens of history, or economics, or geography, or civics, or the other humanities, but looking at them in interrelated ways, and also connecting to reading language arts. Dimension three is about evaluating sources and gathering evidence to respond to the compelling question. Our data. So Gavin, would you go ahead and explain the data to us? Okay. Um, in the age range 18 to 25, we had eight people say that uh, voting does matter, and six people say that it doesn't matter. The fourth and final dimension, probably the most exciting, is communicating conclusions and taking informed action to get out in the world and really make a difference. I want you to exercise your right to vote. They wanted to help solve the societal problem that they discovered for themselves. They were able to conclude that, yes, voting does matter. They didn't really understand why, if people were registered to vote, that they didn't go out and vote. This idea of voter apathy came into play. And we decided as a class that we could do something about it. When you can dig deeply into the curriculum and students have a voice and it's driven by their questions, that we're able to make it more meaningful and fun. And when learning's meaningful and fun and motivating, it's successful. Whether your state has adopted the C3 framework or not, we hope you can utilize this document as a framework for increasing the rigor and relevance of social studies, making it exciting and engaging for your students, and sharing with them skills and ideas for taking real action in the real world. Our goal is to create an engaged, informed citizenry. And providing opportunities for students to do that, this framework allows you to take the work that you're doing and try to enhance it in ways that can build those civic skills, knowledge, and dispositions. So I want to point out special thanks to Social Studies School Service who created this for us as a gift to NCSS. So. Okay. So 
NCSS is working for you. We have just gotten some grant funding, too, from the Gates Foundation and others to create more and more materials. I'll be doing a lot of work here in California, so if you're interested, please stay in the loop and help us move this out. Um, so this is our response, our common core for social studies. Okay, so I'm taking this hat off now. And let's zero down and see, talk a little bit about what's going on here in California, because there, there's some very exciting things going on here, too. Um, in, your, in your brochure, you have a copy of the executive summary of this report that just came out on August 5th. And in a minute, I'm going to invite Debbie Genzer to talk some more about this. Um, you know what the situation is here for us in California. We are the most populous state. Look how many people are living here. In LA County alone, there are 1.6 million students in grades K through 12, probably about 6 million statewide. So we've got a lot of folks living here um, across the nation, and many of them are English learners. I would say even more than a fourth, probably close to a half. So what's the status of civic learning? Has it been here? You know our standards, heavy on history, a little light on the civics piece. Yes, we've got the 12th grade one semester course. Some of you probably in here teach that or been through that. But it's one semester during the year of senioritis. Now well, there's a captive crowd, right? <laughs> assessment, well, you know, until recently, the only assessment in social studies at all was in grades, what, 8, 10, and 11, multiple choice, mostly history stuff. Now all that's been suspended too. And you know, not that we all are big fans of more testing, but you know, if it's not tested, we don't get the resources and support that we need. So the assessment of civic learning, good, engaged, powerful civics is lacking. And of course, you know about our standards that haven't been updated in a while, very history oriented, and it really takes a creative, innovative teacher to stretch it to make that come alive. Okay, so I believe at this point, I'm going to turn this over to uh, our wonderful friend and colleague representing our California Chief Justice, Kantil Sakayue, to Debbie Ganser. Thank you. Sorry. Good morning. I'm thrilled to be here and to see so many dedicated people out on a Saturday morning learning more about civic education and the Constitution. But I also want to say that I want to add to um, Tony Penny's uh, recommendation not to follow animals, not to follow children, and don't follow Michelle Herzog either. <laughs> Such a wonderful presenter. Um, but I am here to talk about the Chief Justice's initiatives here in California. Very honored to represent her today. Um, the Chief Justice, as you may know, is Tani Kantil Sakauwe. The Chief Justice of California is an elected position, but um, the way that we elect them is basically they are nominated um, through a very complex process based on their qualifications for the position. And then we affirm that confirmation when we vote or not. So we've affirmed Tani Kantil Sakauwe. She's, as I said, here for 12 years. And she has made civic learning a top priority of her tenure as our Chief Justice. So you may wonder why. Why would a uh, Chief Justice of California make civic learning a priority? And the, the real reason is that the courts are the end users of our education system. They have jurors come. They have witnesses come. They have court users come who need to file divorce papers, to file uh, criminal complaints. All of these people are coming through the courts, and what they have found is that there's a steady lack of understanding about even basic things like the role of the courts, the role of the judicial branch. In fact, people often get the courts confused with the Department of uh, Transportation or uh, another department. They think, oh, it's a department of the executive branch. So this is very problematic. It, it really puts our whole form of government at risk, and it puts the, de the judicial branch at risk for delivering what it sees as an independent, non-political, impartial role in, in a balanced check and balance system in our state. 
So as such, um, the, uh, the courts put together a group to look at how they could protect the courts for the future. And they made a recommendation that one of the key things that should happen is that every student in the state should have a high quality civic education. And I just want to read to you what's in their report and what guides the Chief Justice's work. They say every, style, every child in the state should receive a quality civic education and judges, courts, teachers, and school administrators should be supported in their efforts to educate students about the judiciary and its function in a de democratic society. So because the courts do pay a lot of attention to what's in writing, um, this is very important to the courts that we have this in writing. And um, so what did the Chief Justice do I want to get this, the direction right on the PowerPoint. What did the Chief Justice do to, um, to make an impact on this issue? Well, the first thing that she did was in 2013, she called together a summit to look at what is the state of civic learning in California and uh, what can be done to improve it and to make some announcements about some things that she would do and others would do to start moving forward on this very important issue. So she called together leaders from labor, business, civil rights groups, and even Sandra Day O'Connor came. She was the keynote speaker, and she headlined this summit and really spoke again from the judiciary's point of view about why this is so important. And in fact, so important that many of you may know that she has devoted her retirement, Sandra Day O'Connor's retirement, to civic learning, and even has um, an online games program that students can play, iCivics. So she is really a key spokesperson on this issue. And in a sense, she tagged Chief Justice Tani Katil Sakauwe to take the lead in California at that summit. So what happened at the summit? Why was it important? And we really see it as a watershed moment for civic learning in California because the Chief Justice made some very key announcements. One is that she was forming an historic partnership with the Department of Education and our state superintendent of public instruction on this issue. And he appeared with her together on stage to let everybody know that this was going to now be something that was going to be more of a priority in California. And at that point, they announced the first winners of the um, Civic Learning Awards for California and that they were sponsoring jointly. And um, they also um, announced that they were going to form a task force to develop a blueprint for how we could improve civic learning in California. Such a wonderful step forward. Now, um, I can also tell you that um, at the summit, we had um, the State Bar of California step forward and say they were going to take the lead on developing legislation that would complement what we were trying to do to elevate civic learning in California. So at the summit, several leg legislators also came to the podium and announced different pieces of legislation that they would want to um, propose or that they were going to propose to move civic lear learning forward. And um, so what I'm going to do now is just describe a little bit about the task force. It did meet, and um, it was established, and it even has completed its work probably in some record amount of time, announced in February of 2013, and um, the report's now complete. But I can say that it wasn't a rush job. It was done very thoroughly, and um, there were a lot of steps involved that I think make the report um, all that more valid for our state. Um, the first thing that happened was uh, the chief and Tom Torlakson um, chose two leaders who would lead the task force to represent, again, this historic partnership between the judicial branch and the Department of Education. And those, uh, those leaders are, uh, were uh, Superintendent Dave Gordon from the County Office of Education in Sacramento and Justice Judith McConnell, who is the presiding administrative justice of the Fourth Appellate District um, of the courts in California. And just so you know, um, it, California is so big. So she is the head of the Fourth Appellate District. 
Can anyone guess how many people might be in the fourth appellate district? Yes. Excuse me? One? Oh, no, no. Two? Two. That would be a guess. Um, I'm talking about that might be the number of appellate justices. How about the number of people that would be using the courts in that appellate district? Ten million. That's right. It's ten million. Very good. Excellent answer. <laughs> ten million people. So we have such a big state. So this, she's a justice that's in charge of all of the appellate court business that has to do in that ten million person area. And the, um, the task force was made up of members, again, who were representing a wide range of groups and individuals throughout California. They included um, people from union, union leadership. We, have, we had Shelley Gupton um, from the California Teachers Association. We had um, leadership from SEIU Local 1000. We also had the head of the Chamber of Commerce, Alan Zarenberg. We had um, uh, the head of MALDEF on that group. We had a very diverse group of people. And you would think that they wouldn't agree with such diverse points of view that they wouldn't agree on this issue. But what we found is that, on the contrary, this is something that's a high priority for all groups, that we be better in California and we actually be a leader in civic learning with our great diversity of our state and with the wonderful um, resources that we have here, we should be a leader on this issue. So um, the, the members came together in um, July of 2013 and they um, developed draft recommendations, and then those draft recommendations were taken out throughout the state to seven regional hearings all throughout the state. They were, um, two were in LA. Were any of you at those regional hearings? Raise your hand if you were. Great. We had two in LA, one of the uh, California uh, Council for the Social Studies Conference, in Bakersfield, Sacramento, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Oakland. We received more than 600 comments, and we had an online ability for people to also put their comments in. And um, we came out with uh, this report that, uh, as Michelle described, is in your pocket, the executive summary. And you'll find um, on the back of that report, you'll find um, a website. It's www.powerofdemocracy.org. Power of Democracy is the key to remember. Um, where you can download the entire uh, report if you would like to. And um, it's, uh, it's not very long, but um, it is longer than the executive summary, of course. Um, I also wanted to make the point that while we were working, we were also trying to promote civic learning. So this task force, of which Michelle was a member, and I, uh, Tony Penney was also on the advisory group. If you were on the advisory group or a member of that task force, could you please raise your hand? Great. Thank you very much for your work. Even while the um, even while the report was um, being written, because there was so much consensus about its importance from this group, we um, made some important uh, contributions that I hope will benefit teachers in the classrooms in your schools. One of the things we did was we we provided input into the English language arts Common Core framework development process. So as you know, that's, that's a framework that's guiding how teachers are going to teach English language arts in California in Common Core. And we worked with that process to integrate civic learning into it. So there are examples of civic learning in vignettes, there are snapshots of civic learning, and most importantly, it says that the purpose of English language or arts in California isn't just college and career. It says college, career, and civic life. That's what English, English language arts, Common Core in California, is about. So we're excited that we made that contribution, and we're looking forward as we uh, move into 
uh, the implementation stage of the task force recommendations to make more significant contributions. Now I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, who's going to talk about the recommendations themselves. Okay, thank you, Debbie. So here's the deal. You saw the list of folks behind this effort. We've got some real star power, and so we want to take advantage of this and go for the gold. So if you take out that executive summary from your inside your um, program, um, I'm going to go over what some of those hard-hitting recommendations are. Because we finally feel like we've got enough political leverage with all of those groups and the advisory, Center for Civic Ed, RSLN, and uh, the pres Annenberg Presidential Learning Center, the Ronald Reagan Library, all of these wonderful groups behind us. When you have state PTA, California school boards, AXA, business community, right? If we can't make this happen, let's go for the gold. So I want you to look at these recommendations because they are very bold. First, we need to update our standards. At some point in time, that's got to be more civic oriented, more civically, intentionally listed in there. And I don't mean just in 12th grade government. I mean starting in kindergarten. Because young children understand those concepts. They understand fairness and equality and justice. First two words out of my little girl's mouth wasn't mommy, wasn't daddy. It was no fair. <laughs> She's 33. She's still saying no fair. I said, give it a rest, honey. But anyway, you get it. Young kids understand these concepts. Our standards need to reflect that in a big way. Our frameworks need to be more heavily weighted to be more intentional around civic learning. As you know, we're getting ready to pick up where we left off with that framework update. The end of this month, it's going to go out for public review. If you're on my listserv through LACO, you will get that information and need to weigh in when our time is ready. So get ready. Because they're going to put the draft out. They're going to give 60 days for people to comment about the importance of adding civic learning through that framework heavy duty. So get on that and help us with that. The second, we need to integrate civic learning into our state assessments. Now, we're not talking about, like I said, adding more tests. But if we're serious about measuring kids' competency, we need some performance-based tasks or some way to hold schools accountable so they will open the doors for us to do the work that we do. There are fabulous programs out here. CRF, Center for Civic Ed, Arsalan. But they can't get in the front door because what are the principals and administrators forced to say? I'm held accountable to X. Is this going to help me get there? Well, let's just change the lever and have civic learning be part of that uh, accountability system. Let's improve some professional learning experiences and give open entree to teachers and schools to be able to utilize them. That's a major recommendation. We want an articulated sequence of instruction in civic learning beginning in K-12 for all kids. If you go to Ellen Middell's presentation, she'll talk about the civic opportunity gap and which kids are getting it, which kids are not. And you can figure that out for yourselves. Kids that are scoring high are given permission to go do that. But kids that are struggling, no, nope, they're an intervention for the rest of their lives, often don't get the opportunity. So we need to turn that around too. Um, we want to establish a communication mechanism so stakeholders can connect with each other, give entree, open doors to get the work and move it forward. And we want incentives for school districts to include it in their local control accountability plans. As you know, your districts put forth plans that were due July 1 to your county office. There's a lot of local control coming your way on how to spend the chunk of change that comes from Sacramento. We developed a working sheet, a guideline to say, hey, Yes, you're responsible for using some of that for student achievement and common core implementation and school safety and school climate. Don't you think good civic learning can address that? You're supposed to be nodding your heads yet. Yes, okay. So get that language into your, you're allowed to do that at district level. Inform your district folks to dedicate line items to their education funding for civic learning to get to those areas. So take some time, look at this executive summary, at powerofdemocracy.org, you could pull down the full study and the report, which was informed by people on the ground doing this hard work. You're all here because you believe in this. If we can put the policies in place at the state level to open the doors so that rooms like this are filled with a million people 
rather than the wonderful group we have here, but many, many more can take advantage of that. That's what we're trying to achieve. Okay, Debbie, I'm going to flip it back to Debbie. She's going to talk a little bit about power of democracy and some other wonderful work that we're showcasing today. So thank you, Debbie. So wrap. So the Chief Justice uh, doesn't want this task force report to sit on the shelf, and she also doesn't want to end with just this one initiative. The Chief Justice sees herself as trying to develop several initiatives that will try to move civic learning forward in California. So to do that, she established the Power of Democracy Steering Committee to follow up on the summit, to oversee the task force, to oversee the awards program, and to oversee implementation of the task force recommendations. So um, I'm thrilled that the chief has taken this kind of initiative. As we all know, reports often get done and often sit on shelves, and that really doesn't do anything to have an impact. So the fact that she really recognizes this and is committed to seeing these recommendations through is a true gift, I think, to all of us. And um, so I want to quickly just go over a little bit more about um, what is going to happen next. Um, the chief is going to be piloting uh, several groups throughout the state that will take responsibility for moving forward with these recommendations locally. So she's in the process of organizing those and figuring out how those should all unfold and we're hoping to make an announcement by November 1st about the locations and the makeup of some of these groups. So stay tuned on that. In addition, um, we are going to be actively involved as follow-up to the task force. This Power of Democracy Steering Committee is going to be actively involved in that history social science framework um, development for California. And we're going to be bringing in um, information from the C3, and we're going to try to really bolster up that document as well so that it's very useful and vibrant and um, reflects our best thinking about civic learning in California. And um, finally, she is committed to continuing her civic learning awards, which are really meant to shine a light on what's possible in California. And I'd just like our civic learning award winners who are here today to um, stand. And let's, let's recognize them. say these teachers, these schools, these students are the true pioneers in California. They, without the state saying, you must do this, they on their own have really taken the leadership and made these things happen. And the students that go to these schools are so fortunate because they're being inspired and led by teachers and administrators who have seen this as, a, as an important issue and have worked to empower students to really take the lead in our state and be leaders in our country. So I just want to acknowledge and thank you all so much for what you've done. And um, I know the Chief Justice really uh, couldn't be more pleased with the winners. And as you know, the prize for many, uh, the top three award-winning schools is that the Chief Justice herself personally visits the school. She likes to learn about exactly what's going on. And um, she has also tasked her colleagues to go visit the other award-winning schools. She can only go to three. So um, she takes a great interest in what's going on and really wants the word to get out about the great things that are happening. So because of that, um, we're thrilled that at this conference, the award winners are here and going to be doing a session to share um, their, their knowledge and um, what, what they're doing and um, just to exchange ideas. So we're looking forward to you all attending. That's at 2.30, I believe. So, um, so with, with that, I thought we would end with a video about the award-winning schools and about the work of the task force. We're raising citizens here. We're not just teaching them how to read and write. We need to teach them how to apply it. So teaching them about what's going on in the world, where the problems 
themselves what is important to them and what the best way that they think to solve those problems are. This initiative has prioritized current events in classroom curriculum, experiential learning. Students are engaging in mock debates, mock trials, and they're talking about issues that are relevant and current and accessible to their lives. You have to show students that their knowledge needs to become hands-on and that they need to apply what they've learned in school to improving the world around them, making the world economically better, socially better, politically better for everybody. Students learn that they have the ability to change the community around them, which is something that as high school students we sometimes feel powerless to do. In the early 90s I participated in a civic learning program and because of that program I could envision myself as a leader in the Latino community. If students don't have access to rich civic learning environments, the majority have declared the ability to really change their lives. The mission of the California Task Force on K-12 Civic Learning is about empowering students with the tools that they need to change their lives and to change their communities. So this initiative, in some ways, is about social change and about empowering these students. Ultimately, the task force is working towards a report in 2014, which will lead to further discussions, dialogues, and investments throughout the state on civic climate. We've got to bring back a system which steeps young people in the importance of participating in our democracy. It's about setting them up to participate, to make a change, to have access. I want students to learn and be great leaders and great writers, but what's most important to me is that they go out to the world and become good citizens. This is our vision for students who are not just prepared for college and career, but who will also make an impact in their communities. There you have it. So we wanted to leave um, a few minutes for questions or comments from you. I know we put, gave you a lot of great information. Hopefully it got you excited about some serious things that are moving forward. Um, before we go there, though, I just got to thank all of you again for coming. Just for giving up a day. Some of you have been up since 2 in the morning to get here. Three hours on the bus. Gosh. For young people, to all of you, it's fantastic. And I got to tell you, I want you to look at those presenters. We have no budget for them. They're here on their own time and their own dime. Our presenters who are in the room, stand up. Thank you for coming out and getting up early. Brian Brady's here from Midfa. All of them. You're being shy. They're great. My LA County Office of Ed folks, Ryan Stow is here. He's the coordinator of our California Democracy School initiative. Where are you, Ryan? He left. He's here. And, and Karen Leffler, you know, is my secretary. So it just really is a group effort. We just love putting this together. We spent about a year planning this, so we hope you're going to enjoy it. All right, so let's take some questions or comments. Tony, do we have a microphone? OK, we put him to sleep. I see. John Minkler, all the way from Fresno. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, the, for this uh, event and, and for the task force report. My question is, if there are teachers here, administrators, or if there are young people here who think that, these, uh, that this blueprint should be adopted and we should have this new emphasis on, on civic learning, what could they do about it? Is there anything that students or teachers could do to support this? That's a great question. Of course, we need everybody's support in this. Um, we'll be putting out information and hope people will jump in and lend their support, lend letters of support. Debbie, she's got some ideas too. I do. Um, one of the things that you'll find in the full report um, is a document in the back of the in the back of the report: How Civic Learning Benefits LCAP. And. That's kind of, LCAP may be a term that not everybody knows here. It's an acronym for the Local Control Accountability um, Planning that school districts are now responsible for. And we really, the, the task force was able to identify 
ways that civic learning can really support those priority areas. It's a great tool. So we're encouraging we're encouraging people to get involved in their local control planning. Local control is now a really important process. It's a great way for student voice to be heard anyway, just to be involved in that process. What is it that the school district is going to be spending money on, right? This is a great question for students to know the answer to. And then in addition, for them to be able to use this task force report to make the case that greater civic learning will support those priority areas. So I encourage you to, to, to take a look at this online line and download it and um, the letter is um, like I said at the end in an attachment that's just one example um, the other is we hope that you will um, take the task force report take the recommendations set up meetings make sure people know about the task force report set up a meeting with your with your board members uh, make sure that they know that this came out. This represents so many leaders in our state, from the Chief Justice to, as Michelle was saying, California school boards, the PTA, the Association of School Administrators. I mean, this is a, a big report, and we want to make sure they know about it. The state superintendent did send it uh, out, a, an announcement on his email, but you know, those things, uh, it's just an email that goes by. It's important that he did it, but I think all of you can bring this to life by going and making an appointment and saying, here, look, this is here, and I'd like to talk about this with you and work with you on making a plan. So those are just a few thoughts that I have, and I'm open to your ideas. I think this is, um, this is going to be an exciting time for us, especially as we get the local advocacy groups set up throughout the state. Any other questions, comments? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, how easy is the shift to learning more about civic learning going to be on the students? Is it going to just be all at once, or is it going to just be slower? Yeah, that's a good question, too. That's going to be the kind of decision that your school or district will want to make. There's a lot of creative teachers out there who are infusing it in different subject areas in different ways. In our California Democracy School Initiative, which is 12 high schools across LA County and Orange, some are putting it in their history courses, some are putting it in English courses, there's some science teachers who are figuring out how to use civic engagement, elective courses, so there's a lot of interesting creative ways to do that, so I hope you stay tuned for that. And I'll just add that one of the strong recommendations that came out from the task force report is that um, civic learning opportunities start as early as elementary school. Um, as Michelle referred to before, her, uh, elementary school students can certainly understand concepts of fairness and um, other fundamental issues, freedom of speech and rules, what do rules mean. And so what we're hoping is that there will be, it'll be like the water, it'll be like the air. Civic learning will be coming in lots of different ways. It will come in elementary school, it will come in high school, it might come strictly in a, um, you know, in a history social science class, but it may come in other ways. The other thing that I do want to highlight is that um, the what we weren't we didn't mention today is that there's research that's been done on the most effective practices in civic education. And the Guardians of Democracy report uh, uh, is a publication that many of you may know of that really highlights what are the research-based proven practices in civic learning. And to answer your question, those six research-based proven practices um, include having student government have more of a voice on your campus, um, having simulations, having lots of clubs where students make a, a choice about what happens in those clubs. So there are, again, multiple ways for your whole entire school to offer civic engagement opportunities, not just academically, although that's a, a cornerstone. Okay, so we'll wrap up now. I know you're anxious to get to your sessions. Tony's going to give us some last-minute uh, marching orders. And again, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoy the day. I think you will. Excellent. So I just wanted to give a few kind of logistical comments and, and get you started this morning. One, there's still some beverages left, so please drink them. Uh, two, if you want, uh, just a reminder, if you want to be... Are they like 
the beverages they had in the uh, Founding Fathers celebration? No, no, we have oh, to. Uh, okay. No. I'm sorry. We'll drink it anyway. It's too early. Um, but we do have some delicious orange juice, which is nearly the same. Um, but uh, if you are interested in participating in one of the Discovery Center simulations in the afternoon, please make sure you stop by the desk with uh, Tracy over there and sign up. Uh, and we are, so once again, the, the building, or the rooms that are in this building, this is the Presidential Learning Center. And then we have the Roosevelt and the Jefferson rooms, kind of around the corner and back there. Uh, in the other room, we have the Air Force One boardroom and the Discovery Center classroom and the Discovery Center. Uh, the quickest way to go back and forth between the two places is just cut right across the parking lot and right by the HVAC unit. It's not the most beautiful way, but it is the quickest. Um, and there's a sign out there, but I'll just say it out loud too. When you get up to the door, it's going to feel like it's locked. There's just a little knob you turn um, to, to go in and out. Uh, and lunch today is also going to be in the Air Force One um, uh, pavilion. So under, we'll be having lunch under the wings of Air Force One. Uh, the in the air condition. In the air condition, yes, it's air conditioned. It's lovely over there. Uh, and how often do you get to eat under, uh, you know, historic plane anyway? So we thought it'd be a nice in the air conditioning. Uh, and finally, at the end of the day, so after you uh, wrap up in your last session at 3:30, you sign out. Uh, make sure you stop by and see our amazing baseball exhibit. For those of you who are baseball fans, it is only here until tomorrow. So you are uh, part of the closing act of this wonderful exhibit, which they have comped for you to go through. Yes. About that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're working hard. You're, you're investing a Saturday. Uh, and it's air conditioned. And it's air conditioned. Uh, a, a nice, cool uh, 72 degrees. Uh, so, uh, with that, please uh, join me in giving one final thank you to Michelle and Debbie for their wonderful keynote.